Good afternoon, everybody. It is 3.30, which of course means it's time for one of our afternoon STEM shows here at the Headwaters Science Center. I'm Ryan, one of the educators here at HSC, and as is typical on a Friday afternoon, I am usually doing something of a follow-up post or follow-up uh, show to Lee's Wednesday reading. And so one of the books Lee read this past Wednesday was a, uh, a book called The Iridescence of Birds, which is sort of a biographical story about a French artist by the name of Henry Matisse. Um, and in it, it kind of talks about, you know, Henry Matisse is this French painter who's active primarily in the early 1900s, late 1800s. And one of the, the particularly interesting pages about it is this one, where it talks about, you know, all of the influences that Henry Matisse had when he was young. And one of them he talks about is that he raised pigeons and watching their sharp eyes and red feet and their colors that changed with the light as they moved and that your mother called iridescence. And I gotta say, I love that definition of iridescence, a thing that basically the colors that it appears to be changes, you know, depending on what angle you're looking at it, what angle the light is hitting it. That's a perfectly functioning definition of iridescence for my, for my money. And so, I wanted to talk a little bit about iridescence. I talked about color not super, super long ago with uh, Angel the Parrot when we were talking about color vision. We talked a little bit about uh, additive versus subtractive colors when you're mixing colors of light versus when you're mixing colors of pigments and things like that. But we didn't really touch on iridescence at all during that. And so I want to talk a little bit about that because iridescence is an interesting phenomenon. It's something that we all see all over the place. You know, the example in the book there was pigeons, and I'm sure you've all looked at you know, birds, and if you look at them in the right light, you'll notice that, yeah, stuff like, you know, like our pheasant has here on his head, where, you know, if you move him around a little bit, his colors, you know, appear to change a little bit, going from greens to blues to purples to almost black, and dep depending on what light he's in. And again, I don't know how well all this is going to translate over through a camera, but... It actually is looking pretty good. Yeah. So you can see the ones on the breast here do something similar with kind of oranges going into purple. The dark ones really pick up. Good. And so, that would be interesting to talk about kind of how that happens, why that happens. Um, and the long and short of it is there's a couple potential reasons why something like that might happen, where you might see... Um, for lack of a better word, rainbows that show up on stuff. Um, a lot of the times it just has to do with sort of uh, light refraction stuff. So a great example of this would be I have a CD that I have here, where, very dusty CD, where I said I can move this around and you're probably seeing rainbows on that CD and they're moving around a little bit. And that is something that is basically strictly just based on refracting light. Um, so the back of the plastic and the sticker that you know makes up the top of the CD basically are functionally acting like a prism would, where you're looking through this and it is breaking the light into its separate separate categories. And it's kind of accidental on this. Like I said, you can do this intentionally, and that's what prisms are. But it happens on a CD as well in a very similar vein. So this is what we call light refraction. Um, Another place you can see this that actually, if you come to the Science Center, there's a few spots where you can see, uh, um, I guess what we would call sort of a like a film-based one, where basically you get this. And again, it's relying on refraction, but it's because you're getting multiple different sort of refractive layers that are kind of stacked on top of each other or are acting in different thicknesses. Uh, so one that I'm sure you've all seen is gasoline acts in a very similar way to this, where if you you know you go to the gas station and someone you know spilled a little on the pavement or whatever, it kind of has that rainbow color to it. Um, that's mostly based on the tendency for gasoline to not necessarily to form a film on top of water specifically. So like you'll see this like if there's a puddle that has gasoline in it is where you'll really see this. And it doesn't necessarily always have a uniform thickness. And so the different colors are a product of the different thicknesses of the gasoline layer that is sitting on top of the puddle of water. Um, this is the same principle that uh, you'll see if you come and visit HSC and use our bubble wall. Bubbles have this various different types of colors that you're going to see coming through them. And what the product of that is, is the soap that is in the water. And so what the soap does is it... Uh, 
like I said, doesn't maintain a uniform thickness. The bubble is mostly made up of water. You know, we think of the bubbles as being made of soap, but the bubble is mostly made of water. Um, and there's soap in there, but the soap is sort of in amongst the water, kind of sitting on top of the water. And it isn't always the same thickness there. And so based on how thick the soap is in a given spot, basically determines what color you're going to see. And then there are things like we are seeing in our feathers here. And so peacock feathers are a very interesting thing. The kind of mechanism for how peacock feathers work, apparently, and I was, I was just doing a little bit of reading on this kind of for this show, is very interesting because it seems like people like didn't really understand what was going on with peacock feathers for a really long time. Um, because you have this iridescent property, you know, you have this certain sheen, you can probably see the colors changing a little bit, just use, even as I'm wiggling around a little bit here. Yeah, can you like, rotate it just a little bit? Yeah, then you can really see it. Kind of rotating it back and forth like that. Perfect. And, uh, what's interesting about peacock feathers is you actually have a couple different things going on with peacock feathers, seemingly. There's something we have called structural color that is, like I said, reliant on sort of this refractive property of um, different materials and different structures. So a butterfly wing would be another example that is really dependent on uh, what we would call structural color. So there's not uh, a pigment in a butterfly wing. So we, again, if you come in HSC, there's, uh, we have our nano exhibit and part of the nano exhibit, there's a thing where we have a blue butterfly wing that is sitting there. And when you press a button, it shines a light from behind the butterfly wing. And when you shine the light through it, the butterfly wing looks brown. And the brown is actually like the, the true color of the wing. Um, that's the color of the pigment in the wing. But basically what you have is the surface of the butterfly wing has these little teeny tiny ridges on it. And those ridges, again, are refracting light in a specific way that makes it appear blue. So there's no blue pigment in this butterfly wing. It's only brown pigment, but because of the way that the wing is built, it appears to be a different color. And you see some of that in a peacock feather. So peacock feathers, similarly, peacocks only have a, a brown pigment in their feathers. So there's, you know, if you're looking at this, you're probably seeing greens, you're seeing blues, you're seeing like a black, you're seeing like golds, kind of coppery colors. But the only pigment that's in this feather is brown. And similarly, if we were to get an adequately bright white light and shine it through the back of this, we probably would see that, kind of similar to how that uh, butterfly wing works down on the exhibit floor. But there's a certain other element to it, too, um, and that is that some, and it seems like it's particularly a thing with birds and then with some, uh, like, insect carapaces, um, where they basically have little crystals mixed in with them. They, uh, like, photonic crystals that are, you know, react to the light in such and such a way that uh, produce a very similar effect, a similar iridescence to what, like, structural coloration does. Um, and so peacocks are one of these things that have these, and the reason they couldn't figure it out for so long what was going on with peacock feathers is because they're small to the point that, like, you needed microscopes that they didn't have access to to figure it out, basically, to look at it. And I want to talk about this guy, too. This is kind of an interesting one where, again, you're experiencing you know, as I move this around, you're probably seeing some different colors happening within our shell here. This is a shell from, let's see, what is this? Abalone shell. And again, you're seeing as I move it around, you know, different colors appearing in there, but it looks a little different than what the other stuff we've looked at. And so this is a very similar, very pretty much the same thing happening, but slightly different. And so what we're seeing here is what we would call pearlescence. And as far as I can tell, the only difference between pearlescence and iridescence is that with pearlescence, you get some white mixed in. Iridescence, it uh, strictly is no white light coming all back scattered. out. It's all scattered. Whereas with pearlescence, you get a mix of white light that is similarly coming back out of it. And so the, the thing that you tend to see this with and most closely associated with is mollusks like this that, uh, you know, which makes sense because these are what make pearls. So there's not perfect diffraction, there's some reflection? Yeah, there's some just regular reflection in there, uh, in the, call this nacre, is what the stuff on the inside of a shell is called. So some of it just reflects straight back out, you get some white light mixed right back in with your diffracted, diffused light. What causes pearlescence instead of 
honestly don't know. Is it just because maybe there's more impurities in like a biological uh, layered surface like that? Like it's going to be more. I mean, you don't see it in like the butterfly wings and stuff like that, where just I've only ever saw those referred to as iridescent. Yeah. So I don't know if it's just a. a particular structural thing with it or if it does have something to do with like the pigments that are in there also i don't know it's a good I'll, question i'll look it up what the like what causes that to happen whether what what determines whether something's going to be iridescent or pearlescent it's a good question and i brought my light table up i was kind of wondering if i could maybe replicate our uh our butterfly wing thing with my light table here but i don't think it's going to be bright enough to really out our peacock feathers being brown no no luck but one of the things I mentioned as something that does uh, pretty frequently exhibit iridescence is insect carapaces. And that's kind of where we're going to start transitioning over to the other side of the table here. Um, so insect carapaces, the, the like shells of insects or something that, like I said, you'll sometimes also, you know, ex see a similar iridescence as you see with like our peacock head or, uh, or a pheasant head or a peacock feather or stuff like that. Um, good example of one that we have right around Minnesota is uh, emerald ash borers have a very distinct iridescence to them when you see them. They're kind of greenish, but they have that, that iridescent sheen to them that is really easy to pick out. Like I said, it's relatively common in not just insect carapaces, but arthropods in general. And so, like I said, we're going to slip over to the other side of my table here. And... The other thing we're doing here today is we have an upcoming event on March 26th, 2022. If you're coming back and watching this and it's after that, sorry. Uh, where we are doing another prehistoric painting night. And so you might remember if you're a follower of the Science Center, we did one of these back in October. We uh, were planning on doing these more regularly. We had a little bit of a hitch as far as our supply chain on our, uh, on our uh, filament for our 3D printer that postponed our second one, but it is happening. We have all of them printed out already, our next critters. And so what we are going to be doing this time around are trilobites. And I think trilobites are really uh, interesting critters, um, outstandingly successful animals. Um, there's something of like, it's like 20 plus thousand different species of trilobite that have been identified. Uh, just from the fossil record, which means there's probably way, 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 way more species than that that actually existed. Um, especially when you consider how old they are, too. The last trilobites died out like 250 million years ago. The last trilobites died out before the dinosaurs uh, existed. Um, but they were, like I said, outstandingly successful. They were like the, probably the dominant species on, or I guess family of species, um, on planet Earth for... You know, 200 plus million years, which, you know, trilobites, trilobites existed for longer than, the, the reign of trilobites is longer than the amount of time that has happened since trilobites went extinct. Trilobites existed for like almost 300 million years, which is, you know, in the scale of like life on this planet is a tremendously long amount, long period of time. What were some of their mechanisms of survival? Yeah, and so these guys uh, come about about 500 million years ago um, during the, uh, you know, you have a big sort of explosion of life that is happening at the that Cambrian. time. Yeah, you might even call it the Cambrian explosion. Um, and so a bunch of the families that we have today are ones that initially became things during this time period. So pre-Cambrian explosion, so you're talking pre, you know, five, six hundred or so million years ago. Um, really, the only life we had on Earth were uh, like sponges, well, multicellular life, let's say. Yeah. Were things like sponges. You had some real early cnidarians that existed, so jellyfish. like box jellyfish yeah. and anemones and things like that. Um, that was mostly it. Yeah, I was gonna say it's, sponges and cnidarians. <laughs> I can't think of anything else. As far as like stuff that existed, and then like I said and about then maybe like small protists. When did protists evolve, or were they um, later? There probably are protists at this point, yeah. Okay. Um, but then, like I said, during this Cambrian explosion, you said 500 to 600 ish million years ago, you suddenly see this huge diversification that happens, particularly with invertebrates, animals that don't have backbones. And so you see mollusks happen. Um, pretty shortly thereafter, you get 
arthropods that come about. So things like our trilobites. Um, echinoderms, things like uh, sea stars and sea urchins and things like that come about during that time. This is also when you start seeing the first vertebrates, so the real early like jawless fishes are In coming about yeah. about this time. In terms of echinoderms, is it mostly what defines them radial symmetry and like the central mouth and the ability to regenerate? Is that what? The so yeah, the, que the question was what's like the defining trait of echinoderms? Um, the physical trait that is like very deeply associated with them is having a like internal skeleton of sorts. Oh, like microtubules. They almost. yeah, they have this kind of weird like lattice work skeleton yeah. that exists within them. Um, and they were really the first things to like have a an endoskeleton that way. Like I said, it's not we don't traditionally think of them as having an endoskeleton because they're invertebrates, but they it's they, more kind of random yeah. scaffolding almost. Yeah, and so like the name, like you literally break the name down, and it's like it's like spiny skin is what mm -hmm. it they are named after is like the surface of them. Um, but as far as I've ever read, the like actual thing is the like lattice work skeleton thing is sort of the original like unifying trait among them. <laughs> um, but you're right, there's things like the radial symmetry that is also kind of part and parcel with that. But those are more just kind of like chance. Or like, they're not the defining character, I guess. Yeah. Um, but anyways, back to arthropods. Yeah, and so, and so the big innovation that comes about during this time period are hard parts. So we're not getting too far off a of, off of base there, talking about echinoderms, but hard parts are basically the thing that really is like the big innovation that facilitates a lot of changes that are happening around this time. And so the mollusks are really the first ones to integrate it in like a meaningful way, so this is your like squid beaks and your snail shells and things like that but arthropods come about pretty shortly thereafter and they really really kind of make it their own by having the the arthropod exoskeleton um and what hard parts get you is a really it, it gives you the structure that allows you to be ambulatory in a way that stuff before really couldn't it is lets it, you move <laughs> is it chitin all the way back then um yeah, this would be chitin. Were they were arthropods the first chitinous animals, or were there others? Maybe the beaks on I don't actually know. Are those keratin? Yeah, I don't actually know what like squid beaks are made out of. Octopi beaks not, and squid beaks. I'll look it up. I know that like uh, like snail shells are not. They're like a. Um, it's like a silicate, isn't it? Yeah, they're. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Because they're super ba they're super basic, the snail shells. They can grind the snail shells up and literally use them as like an antacid if you wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, you wow. Okay. Um, it says that chitin um, was... Uh, it's horizontal gene transfer from fungus to diatoms. Huh. And then also some little amoeba that evolved it. Huh. There you go. So, mushrooms to little glass uh, plants that float around on one part, and then on the other part there was some little, little, basically multi-celled amoeba that would have been microscopic that evolved the ability to synthesize it. And so, like I said, arthropods really, like I said, integrate a lot of this into them. That's like the defining trait of them is this exoskeleton. The, the, uh, and trilobites are, like I said, sort of the iconic arthropod from this time period. Because like I said, there's a huge diversity of them. You see fossils of them all over the place. The numbers of them are nuts. You see them in so across so many different locations. You see them across so many different strata of you know soil layers where you know they existed for a long time and are really successful for a long time. Like I remember even like as a kid, like I had a bag of little trilobite fossils that like my dad had found somewhere because he you know does he's a soil scientist and so he'd be out doing soil stuff and would stumble upon them every once in a while and. Uh, 
he would bring them back and show them to me, and I thought they were super cool, because I was like, ooh, these are even older than dinosaurs. So all the other kids are into dinosaurs, I'm like, my thing's even older. And I thought I was very cool for that. I had a little, like I said, I had this little bag of them. But one thing that is, I think, kind of interesting with trilobites is because they're so deeply associated as being fossils, because they're so common as fossils, when you, like, when you picture a trilobite, you picture a fossil in yeah. a way that you don't necessarily do with like a dinosaur like i say hey picture a t-rex you picture a thing that has like skin right lizard looks like <laughs> right thing. whereas when i say picture a trilobite like you don't actually picture like a living trilobite you think of a rock that's you know yeah. shaped like a trilobite and what's interesting about that is it tends to mean that the color we tend to associate with trilobites is going to be you know whatever color you know rocks are so you tend to see trilobites oftentimes depicted as being you know, brown and gray Brownish and, gray, kinda, you know, yeah. that type of, you know, dirt color, rock color. But there's really no reason to think that that was necessarily the colors that they were. I mean, you think about arthropods that exist today and they come in all sorts of colors. Um, some of them come in multiple colors. Some of them have iridescence to them. I mean, look at uh, things like mantis shrimp where they have, you know, a million different colors on them, all sorts of iridescences. They can see way more colors than we can. Um, one of our recently deceased critters here at the Science Center was a crayfish who was blue, like fully just a different color than, you know, typically what we would associate with a crayfish. You know, the crayfish around here are oftentimes, you know, kind of a grayish, greenish color, I guess would be the standard, but there's yellow ones, there's blue ones, there's ones that have multiple colors to them. We have the rusty crayfish that have the red spots on the side. They come in all sorts of different colors, and there's really no reason to think that uh, trilobites didn't come in a bunch of different colors too. And so, I think what we're going to do is we're going to have some fun here and paint my trilobite a few different colors. Although, man, I'm not, I'm not getting lucky with my draws here. I just pulled three random colors and I got brown, also brown, and gray. <laughs> <laughs> Fitting for fossils, I guess. How about... Some bright yellow. So yeah, what is it? Blues. What is it that they eat? They are they trial bites? Yeah. Um, hard to say exactly. They do have their mouths are on the bottom, um, so they're probably for the most part just scrounge around plant. on the bottom for whatever they can find. Bottom feeders or like plant feeders maybe. Yeah, yeah and I don't know if they do necessarily if there is like an established diet for them. I said, if you're just like a bottom feeder, typically you're going to be an omnivore of some because description because you're going to be, you're going to be getting an omnivore diet kind of regardless. What's the name of that stuff? It's like uh, ocean rain where it's like all the just like little bits of like nutrients that just slowly kind of drift toward the ocean floor. What are talking about? Conceptually, yes, but I don't know the for it. There's like some sort of phrase for it, but... Ooh, that's a fun one. That's the kind of stuff that they would probably be eating at, don't you think? Yeah. And so, I'm no Henry Matisse, so I'm probably not going to be able to really establish or really replicate iridescence when it comes to uh, <laughs> painting my, my little trilobite here. But, I'll start with that. Nice dark green base, why not? Wow, they were really uh, diverse. Yeah, says, like I said, it's like 20 plus thousand species that have already been identified. Some were predators, some were scavengers, some were filter feeders, some fed on plankton. So, I mean, they really ran the gamut. They did like, so I've, everything. I've heard some of them as being like free swimming too, rather than yeah. like actually just like chilling on the bottom, like actually getting up around and swimming as yeah. like a life model for that, them. That's what it says, and some swam feeding on plankton. So it seems like the ones that went around looking for little plants to eat. Uh, and then I don't know what uh, exact species my, uh, my little one that I've got here is. Um, if it is modeled after a specific species, or if it's just sort of a general basic trilobite. But... Some of them look really interesting. Some of them have really, like wide sort of ocean. yeah there's there's one that you see around sometimes that has like this big weird like projecting like stem mouth out it's, the front of it yeah this one i'm looking at has like two big hooks like on either side of it kind of which are yours is almost like hammerhead yeah. well and 
I guess I didn't look this up, but I assume the unifying thing, based on the name, is that the head has three lobes on it. Tri 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 lobe tri bites. Yeah. <laughs> so one, two, three. <laughs> Let me zoom in a little bit here and see. Um if I can spot that. Are these guys related to roaches in any way? Um I mean, insofar as they're arthropods, but roaches right. are roaches are insects. These guys I don't even know if these guys would count as crustaceans. I think they're their own separate, like, family that is fully extinct. I don't know from the, where exactly they exist in the it's arthropod From tree. the class Trilobita, yeah. which makes sense. So yeah, that's um, a fully separate thing. Yeah, and it has a bunch of different orders. Um, it doesn't even talk about the genuses, probably because there's so many. Um, yeah, trilobita. So those probably don't yeah, exist. That's a that's a fully extinct yeah. order then. So what in, ended up extincting them? Probably some sort of ocean chemistry change. Yeah, I mean, it's great dying stuff. So it's like uh you know, the end of the end of the Cambrian, it's two hundred and fifty million years ago or so, you get Sort of a mix of different factors that are sort of thought to contribute to it. Uh, part of it is you get a big change in ocean temperature. I think the oceans get a lot warmer all of a sudden. There's like a pretty substantial like change in oxygen levels associated with like a bunch of tectonic activity and temperature change that happens. It's something like, it's like 90 something percent of species on Earth all go extinct within like 10 million years. Oh. It's Amazing. Um, so yeah, if you are uh, wanna wanna look up more about that, it's uh, the Great Dying is the event. Crazy. I should look that up. Was that the largest extinction event in Earth history? Um, we talked about this in one of the shows, actually. Kind of the debate about that. I think as far as like the percentage of species that go extinct, yes. But as far as the like percentage of like individuals oh, wow. on the planet, probably no. Yeah, uh, it's... because the oxidation event like wipes out like a lesser percentage of species, but it wipes out like way more. Just like is it individuals? Yeah, cause see, okay, so the Permian Triassic extinction event, which is the one we're talking about, in terms of extinction intensity which is defined as percentage of marine genera that are present in each interval of time but do not exist in the following interval. Um, so it's, it's, it's essentially like uh, counting up uh, genus diversity, but not actual like total number dead or biomass. It's, it's more proportional. Um, and so it's like in terms of biodiversity loss, the, the Permian-Triassic extinction event is like by far the highest so yeah and a big part of that is because there was such a big diversification that happened leading up to it you right. had a there's more artificially th high number of species right there's more not artificially i mean it happened naturally obviously but a strange number of species that existed leading up to it and then a bunch of them die off yeah there were there was a i mean like we were talking about twenty thousand species of trilobites even like um it seems like the ecology of the earth got so mature that like new it was like niche on niche on niche yeah. created um, yeah and that tends to be what you see is you get a big you get a period where you experience like a huge amount of diversification and pretty shortly thereafter you get a large-scale extinction that happens yeah because and it, it happens on something of a cycle because of because of climate change basically where you get a relatively stable climate for an extended period of time and a bunch of different species evolve to fill these like hyper specific niches and then once yeah. climate change happens that niche quits existing and everything that evolved to fill that niche dies off and you generalists move on and become the the basis of the next boom of speciation basically so you see niches that were previously occupied and then emptied replaced by like variant versions of whatever generalists survived in the future mm -hmm. that start to specialize again as populations diverge 
Yeah, like you want to see like some real wild looking animals like look right before a big extinction event. And they're getting <laughs> crazy. They're all like hyper specialized yeah. and like um it's interesting how regular the die off looks on the I, I mean this is just by you know, by the naked eye, so I have no idea. Yeah, I mean it's like every you know like fifty couple, million years yeah, or so. Every it looks every like. hundred million years roughly probably you get a Extinction that you know wipes out like eighty plus percent of yeah, life on Earth. It's kind of crazy. Like, Just all of a sudden, something changes in the whole system of ecology, sort of. Yeah, and a lot of the resets. times, because because typically what it is is like an ocean chemistry change. Yeah. That is associated with it, or uh, and typically it's like an oxygen level thing. Which is a little disturbing considering the current. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's been. 65 million years since the last one <laughs> and we are really changing ocean yeah ocean chemistry nowadays yeah i mean maybe we can talk a little bit about because i think this is on topic about um yeah and we got all the time in the world <laughs> ocean, yeah ocean acidification um and the reaction of carbon dioxide uh with water to form carbonic acid so i'll look it up um yeah acidity is a thing obviously temperature is a major thing um Oxygen content is a major thing, which is real closely tied to temperature, obviously. Colder colder water is more able to hold oxygen than warm water is. Yeah. Um, so... Carbonic acid, essentially, is um, a relatively weak acid. I mean, it's by definition a weak acid. And also in just sort of like relative terms, a kind of weak acid that forms in the blood um, when carbon dioxide reacts with water um, in a uh, I think there has to be a better way to open these paints. I should say, like, part of the reason that I do these for Carl is Carl is actually a very good, like, miniature painter. He yeah. does that a lot. And so he asks me to make one of these because I'm not, and so I tend to do a bad job. And then if there's an example that uh, looks bad, people don't feel bad when theirs ends up looking bad. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> you look like you're doing a pretty good job so far. I mean, I'm having a real time opening up these paints. Yeah. <laughs> um, so essentially it's a reduction reaction. Um, carbon dioxide reacts with free hydrogen protons. Um, floating around in water, um, which is just sort of a natu natural in-wall water, which is about 7.0 pH. Um, there's just going to be a bunch of free protons uh, that dissolve basically away from H2O, leaving OH, which is basic, mm -hmm. and H+, plus, um, which is the definition of acidic. Um, and those H+, plus, um, uh, protons react with carbon dioxide in the water to form carbonic acid um, and that happens all the time in our body um, there's even something we call the like carbon cycle I can't remember the exact phrase for it but um, but basically through the process of metabolism um, you're constantly consuming water um, and oxygen and forming carbonic acid in your bloodstream, um, which is part of the reason that like we have to pee and part of the reason that we have to stay hydrated um, beyond just needing a terminal electron acceptor for metabolism. It also is important for not overly acidifying your body. Um, and so as we add more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, uh, we also risk um, all of that carbon dioxide uh, mixing with the ocean water on on a large scale, producing large amounts of carbonic acid in the oceans and changing the pH scale. And as we've just been talking about, um, changes in ocean chemistry and ocean temperature are a lot of times major catalysts for large extinction events. So it's something that we should think about and be aware of um, when considering modern climate change and, and yeah. you know, an anthro... Uh, Anthropocene, you know, human-caused climate change. Yeah, a lot of the 
a lot of the talk around climate change goes into like atmospheric conditions specifically. We're right. talking about the the greenhouse gases floating around up in the air, but so a lot of the times when these big extinctions happen, it happens to the ocean primarily, mm -hmm. and this is probably going to be no different. Where you know dumping a bunch of CO two ends up with, as James was just saying, a more acidic ocean. Um. Which ain't great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you've ever if you've ever looked after a saltwater tank, like, uh, or just like for fish in general, you know, this is like just anecdotal, but like you know how um, sensitive stuff is to pH changes, mm -hmm. um, and even we're super sensitive to pH changes. Um, I should look up what the natural human body pH is, and then what it is when you're like basically dead. It's not a huge difference. Um, right, yeah. Human life requires um, your serum, which is the liquid that carries around your blood cells. Um, it needs to be between 7.35 and 7.45 um, at all times to That's survive. A pretty which, pretty which narrow a range there. Tiny range, yeah. Um, like if you were trying to titrate uh, a solution between 7.35 and 7.45 pH, you would need some really good equipment and a lot of patience because that would be tough to do. Yeah. Um, and so, so for for pH seven is neutral. So right. We're talking about a slightly slightly basic blood. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you think about it, if you're constantly producing CO two, um, which is constantly uh, reacting with the water in your blood to make carbonic acid, um, it makes sense that your body would need to be partially uh, alkaline or basic to counter that. Um, and so, and it also works out nicely because another part of your body produces hydroxyl, um, which are basically free radical bases that can react with the acid. So there's, there's sort of these countering waste products that can cancel each other out in your bloodstream. Um, that's not the whole thing, but... Anyways, stuff that I think is interesting, but but the point that I'm trying to make when I talk about that very small range of pH that the human body can exist in, and the same goes for most other animals too, there are some animals that probably have a slightly wider range, but really, to maintain homeostasis, you can't, your pH has to be pretty heavily buffered. And not just animals. And pretty plants. Much every, everything every living that's thing, alive. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a reason that, you know, you can't raise fish in a tub of vinegar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so, <laughs> large-scale changes in the ocean chemistry and in the pH, I mean, let me find some data on the pH, ocean pH change over the last like, 50 years. Dan, you'll see pH stuff in a couple spots around the science center like the most prevalent place we probably talk about ph is with the bog tank because we have a lot of bogs around northern minnesota and bogs are really interesting in that they are very very acidic as far as like things that life exists in yeah like uh the bog that we have in our tank um has been there for going on like two and a half years now and we have like over that two and a half years raised the pH in that tank very slowly, basically over that entire time. When we got it, the pH of the, the pH of the bog that we cut that section of uh, sphagnum out of was like a four and a half, something like that, which is, like I said, quite acidic for something that stuff lives in. Right. Um, and it's pretty close to a seven now. It's like almost up to neutral, but like I said, we've been steadily raising it up for over two years at this point to kind yeah. of get to that point specifically because we were like maintaining that ph and like that particular ph is hard yeah <laughs> so right. it's a lot easier if we could just put uh put our own water in it because mm -hmm. what, what's ultimately going to happen is like the the water in it is going to be like of that acidity that like it was when we initially harvested it but water evaporates water goes away we have to be constantly replacing water and so if we can't replace the water with something of a similar pH, like the pH is going to naturally work its way back up to neutral because right. we're putting 
reverse osmosis deionized water in it that is a Almost flat seven. Perfectly <laughs> seven, yeah. As close to a seven as you're going to get. Yep. And so, like I said, we're pretty close to a seven in there now. But he said it's taken us a while to get there without tanking the whole thing. Yeah. And so I'm looking here at this ocean acidification graph that's from uh, NOAA. Um, what is that? The national... What does it stand for again? Oceanic... I should look it up. Yeah. NOAA, National Oceanic... And Atmospheric and Atmospheric Administration. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and, and so this graph that they've done, um, they, they tracked atmospheric CO2 going all the way back to the mid-50s, but they started tracking ocean pH um, in just 1987 or so, it looks like. Um, and then the graph ends at like 2008. Um, so imagine that this has basically considered, continued at a linear rate in the direction that all these trends are going. Um, are if they, not faster. Are they seeing this image? Do you have it pulled up? No. Oh. Um, how do I pull, Can I pull it up? Um, you could. I have painty hands, so I can't do it. But uh, you could uh, download the image and then bring it in as an image asset onto the, onto the stream. Well, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm just kind of giving the background. I'll so just describe or you the could, numbers. Or uh, you could do like a window capture. Yeah. As well. But I'll just quick mention the numbers. So, but basically, since 1987, it shows that the average seawater pH um, was uh, just a little bit less than 8.13, maybe about 8.12 or so. And then in just, you know, 20 years or so, up until like about 2008, um, it fell 0 0.05, um, you know, cents down to about 8.08. So, uh, 8.13, 8.12, down to 8.08 in just 20 years. I mean, we were just talking about how the human healthy range um, of pH is only 0.10, it's only 10 cents, and already the ocean has dropped uh, 5 cents, um, you know, becoming that much Within more the last 20 in just years. 20 years. Yeah. Um, and there's no sign that any of this stuff's going to slow down. If anything, it's going to speed up. Um, and so not to be depressing about it, but it, it's, it's important to know these numbers and understand that this is what's happening um, and that this is how history works and, you know, this is what happened to trilobites. Not the same causes. Um, I can't remember what, what actually triggered the great dying. A um, bunch of tectonic stuff, yeah, basically. Yeah, <laughs> right. So just essentially over time enough... Uh, uh, the stuff that comes out of rocks. volcanoes tends to be uh, acidic as well. Pretty uh, caustic. So opened up a bunch of underwater volcanoes that probably changed the ocean. Uh, uh, you know, proton count, basically. Um, but anyway... So it doesn't matter. I mean, if we're, if we're causing it from human cause, which really is the, the current consensus that, you know, the human burning of fossil fuels, um, outputting CO2 is the major cause, as well as agriculture, like methane production from cows and other livestock. Um, and then like fertilizers, which, uh, you know, nitrogen, nitrogen, um, phosphates, um, that kind of stuff is really what most people believe is causing climate change at this point, what most scientists uh, have ascertained. But regardless of how it's happening, the, the CO2 chain shows that it is happening. What's up? Um, there's downstairs, downstairs in the back room. Um, let me just show you. Yeah, I'll keep them busy. And so yeah, what I'm doing here is you're seeing I'm painting sort of a bunch of different colors. Um, realistically, is there a trilobite out there that is green and purple and yellow? Probably not. But I noticed like as I was looking at my like pheasant here and at my uh, peacock, like green to purple seems like a relatively common like side of the spectrum for iridescence to exist in. I said, I don't have any particular evidence that says trilobites were iridescent, but I also don't have anything that says they wasn't. 
It wasn't. Yep, they were. And like I said, I'm just kind of having fun with it. But yeah, like I said, these extinction events have happened on several occasions throughout Earth's history. Life on Earth has existed for about a billion-ish years. Is about when you see at least the first animals, I guess, on Earth. Life has existed longer than that, but the first animals, you're talking like 800 million to roughly a billion years ago. First, like, stuff we would broadly consider animals, which, like I said, is like sponges and stuff like that. And, like I said, in that time, you've got, you know, since, since that uh, 800 or so million years ago, there's probably... You know six or seven of these extinction events where like i said you're talking about like 80 plus percent of the species on earth going extinct so and basically it's always some sort of large atmospheric or oceanic chemistry change that happens the kind of first real big one is the great oxidation event which is the thing that kind of cleared the way for animals to become a thing where before before that, basically all you had was a bunch of, like, uh, mostly single cell life that didn't actually use oxygen as their, like, primary uh, respiration thing. They actually respirated methane rather than oxygen. And so the Earth was a lot warmer because methane is a much uh, more effective greenhouse gas than CO2 is. And so you saw, like I said, all these methane respirating stuff that existed. And then all of a sudden what you had developed were plants, basically. You know, had the first plant-like stuff, I guess, with, uh, with algaes developing. And algaes used CO2 as their thing that they were taking in and were outputting oxygen as a waste product like modern plants do take in co2 respirate ox or produce oxygen as a waste product and what you saw was a big chunk of the atmosphere went from being like a co2 atmosphere because the stuff that was using methane was producing co2 as a waste product and so you had a big like co2 based atmosphere co2 and methane and so you then, because of all this CO2, you eventually got a thing that's used it. And like I said, that's what these blue-green algaes were. And so these blue-green algaes were taking in CO2 and producing oxygen as a waste product and created this big atmospheric chemistry change where suddenly you had a bunch more oxygen in your atmosphere um, than what had been there previously. And the result was basically a huge temperature drop that happened on the world. And so, you know, you have this giant extinction event that happens where basically everything that previously had relied on methane to respirate goes extinct. Is this and, the great oxygenation you're talking about? Yep. Yeah. And so that's a kind of the first like big big like mass extinction event is like I said predicated on not an oceanic chemistry change but yes an oceanic chemistry change but kind of predicated on an atmospheric one Yeah. where you saw they said a bunch more oxygen suddenly in the atmosphere that um, you know, works its way into the oceans too and creates kind of an opposite problem where we're concerned more about warming of the planet right now. Um, in that event, what happened was basically a big cooling off where you had not enough greenhouse gases because all these algaes were sucking up all the CO2 in the atmosphere and replacing it with oxygen that made the Earth a lot colder than it had been previously. Yeah. The balance of our atmosphere is like quite a bit more tenuous than we might think. Um, just the, the interplay of, uh, you know, carbon dioxide, oxygen equilibrium, um, as well as just like all sorts of, uh, a lot of life is predicated off of equilibrium reactions. So the cycle between two states of matter, or, you know, not states necessarily, but two different chemicals um, that react with intermediaries to turn into each other and then back and forth and back and forth. And that's how a lot of our metabolic cycles are maintained. Um, and in the same way, like the atmosphere uh, is, is sort of a cycle between carbon dioxide and oxygen. And, and it's the point is that too much of either um, over 
uh, overstacking one side of the reaction can have negative effects yeah. um, for animals that re you know rely on that equilibrium point. Yeah, and like there's basically nothing anymore that relies on methane to respirate. It's right. like a bunch of like single cell stuff that exists like as gut flora in animals and then some like real like deep sea like vent yeah stuff ones that, that are hanging around some like ocean vents but you know like i said go back 750 million years ago and that's literally all life represented a hundred percent of life on the planet was methane respirating and to think about if you think <laughs> about it i mean there probably is a pretty large number of methane respiring uh bacteria in like gut microbiomes and stuff like that like probably pretty widespread between a lot of different land and sea animals you might guess because it's i mean the stomach is sort of a uh anaerobic spot isn't it mm -hmm. yeah yeah it, it has to be for those types of things to exist in it like i said the stuff that relies on methane to respirate like you expose it to oxygen it fully just dies yeah <laughs> like... So I wonder what kind of stuff could survive oxygen um, at the time of the great oxygenation event. Do you think there was just enough time for transition for some that could just slightly tolerate oxygen better to become? Yeah, more I would bet it was stuff trouble. that was already living like deep ocean for the most part, where the oxygen wasn't making its it way wasn't down there, permeating all the way down yeah. there. Yeah, but because like the stuff that. And so it just slowly starts to, once everything on the top is dot dead, there's a bunch of open niches and a bunch of nutrients, they start to kind of almost colonize. Um, what, do they, what do they call it? Uh, it's not like adventure, like when you have like succession of a prairie, you have like journeying or adventuring. Do you know what I'm talking about, um, yeah. plants? The first things that colonize um, are recently okay. successed ecosystem. Um, I got way too much orange paint out here for how much orange I want to do. Oh yeah, let me zoom back in on your work here. <laughs> so yeah, and uh, I don't know if these two lumps on top of my trilobite are meant to be eye spots or not. I would guess they're not actually eyes, but I wouldn't be surprised, I guess, if they're like photosensitive spots. A lot of, particularly marine life, will have these photosensitive spots on top of their head. Just Photo so eyes. they they know what is up and down, kind mm -hmm. of, and can avoid... Uh, being exposed to light conditions. They want to be undercover most of the time, most of right. these things. And so you will see a lot of animals that have, like I said, not necessarily eyes per se, but these photosensitive spots. They probably um, also have pretty sophisticated chemoreception, don't you think? Probably. Um, um, but most of the like head parts for this thing would be underneath this front scoot here. I guess I would call these scoots. I guess I don't know if these are technically scoots or not, if we, if we refer to them as scoots. Scoots are like armor plates, basically. But the head, the main head part is underneath here, and this is like looking straight down for the most part. Um, like I said, you have these two lumps on the back that, like I said, I'm assuming are photosensitive spots, but I guess I don't actually know. It could just be spots that are on the carapace for whatever reason. I don't know. I wonder um, if maybe just having some sort of like uh, focal points helps distribute uh, energy. Yeah, and you can see uh, something similar to this again if you come and visit us at HSC. Uh, the sea urchin that we have in the salt tank has similar, not eyes, but photosensitive spots on top. So if you look at the sea urchin, uh, you'll see a bunch of little reflective areas basically on top of it, and that's what those are. And the, the but like the, the hissing cockroaches, for example, will have similar little little bulges little horns, on the, yep. on the that's, top of their That's kind of what I was thinking there were similar to, or the little horn things on top of yeah. the hissing cockroaches. And I don't really know what the use of those are. Um, they don't really, they don't have eyes on them. No, they don't. And the males use them for like scrape, for scrapping with each other a little bit. Yeah, um, makes sense. But the females have them too, I think, don't they? Sort of. They're not nearly as prominent in the females. Mm. Like that's how I tell the males and the females apart when I'm pulling them out. You can look at them and tell basically how pronounced those spots are. Is So do you think the trilobites could be sparring themselves? Maybe. Um, Having sort of like non-lethal weapons for sparring, or like competing with like interspecies competition, con specific Yeah, uh, is a pretty, competition. can be pretty advantageous. 
Yeah, and that's, uh, like I said, it's advantageous to the point, I don't remember what show we were talking about this with, but something like uh, like deer antlers, for example, pretty bad, like yeah. pretty useless to have for the most part. But just being able to but, sort out whoever, the, the sort of like mating order, like they're not males really quick like that, they're not really useful. They're not very useful for like fighting off predators, they're not useful as far as like digging for food for the most part, they like get, deer like, use their hose, but like... in the woods. Yeah, they're they're obscenely meta me metabolically like intensive to make because you're basically having to grow like an arm's worth of bone over the course yeah. of like a couple months. Yeah, like they're crazy expensive to mm -hmm. make, um, but they still do it because and they drop them. It's like yeah, and then they just drop them a couple months later, and the they because uh, the benefit is you know you get sexually selected for yeah. basically you can and it's incredibly efficient and strong sexual selection. And just for that, it just shows how much more goes into total selection than just fitness, which a lot of people yeah. like to kind of... I mean, it is all fitness at the end of the day, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, just being the strongest, the fastest, the, you know, most alert deer does not necessarily mean that yes, you, you have, are the fittest. You, you have know? different forces acting in all sorts of ways, and, like, there's probably a reason why, like, juvenile deer don't make them. Yeah. Like, because they're bad. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, if you're not... It's worth if, just trying to survive. Yeah, like, if you... it, when you're a baby, like, you don't have to worry about sexual selection mm -hmm. because you're not reproducing anyway. So you don't make them because they make you more likely to die because they're bad. They're just, like, and then by the time always, <laughs> extremely expensive, get in the way, um, make it hard to move your head around fast. Um, yeah, God, God forbid you're a moose who loses one antler. Like, yeah, I mean, you're what it, you're what stuck you walking around like this for. Point. Yeah, yeah, you just die. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you can try to knock your one antler off, maybe, and I wonder if they try that. Um, I mean, presumably there's a phase for all of them because they presumably don't exactly drop off at the exact same moment all the time. Right, but I think like, they both kind of fall off at about within like a couple of days, even yeah. like. If not even sooner, um, but yeah. Like and basic, other... basically, like we were saying, the the benefit for them is for competition within other species. You want a weapon that you can use to fight other members of your species that is not lethal, because you don't want to be killing other members of your species, because then the population becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but you do want to like establish dominance within the species, and right. so antlers are useful for that. They're designed to be a non-lethal weapon. Yeah, basically. Which means they're pretty trash at fighting off like wolves. But, yep. but it's kind of interesting. I mean, it just shows how much uh, excess energy that in among deer, like a male has compared to a female. Because like if a female has to carry um, offspring, um, that's a huge uh, energy investment. Um, but for the males, they have a lot of that extra latent energy that they can afford to spend on antlers for competing over mates, I guess. Um, I don't know. It's interesting stuff. I was thinking about those fish that have... It's an example of uh, uh, balancing selection where the females are... Like, they, the mates that they want to select are the ones that have the, like, orangest, prettiest scales. I can't remember. It's some sort of goldfish. Yeah, I mean, that's, like, a classic, like, bird thing, too. Yeah. You know, this, this whole thing here, like, is pretty bad. Makes like, you easy to see. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, like, yeah. Yeah. And, like, the dynamic at play there is basically that, like, you, you see that this type of thing happening where you have female selection of mates. The females are the ones being selective of the, the mates that they take. Which is usually which is, the case. Which is typical animals. because yeah. the female investment in reproduction is much greater than the male one is. Mm -hmm. Producing an egg is expensive. Carrying an egg to the point of giving birth is expensive. Giving birth is giving dangerous. Giving birth is dangerous and expensive. Protecting young is also dangerous, dangerous and expensive. And expensive. Yep. <laughs> you know, maintaining young after they're born is dangerous and expensive. So they are, they typically are the ones that get to be choosy. And so what yeah. you see are the females get to, like, 
optimize her survival, basically. Because yeah. they don't have to pick So they'll names. have camouflage so, colors. They might be a little bit smaller to help hiding. Yeah. Might be a little bit faster. Whereas the males, because they have to worry about sexual selection, end up picking all the picking up all these traits that are largely disadvantageous for actually surviving, but are advantageous as far as being selected for as mates. So, yeah. you know, this weird iridescent head, something that, like, you can spot a mile away and, like, isn't valuable at all as camouflage yeah. is probably anti-valuable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> whatever, the, whatever the disadvantageous. Um, Deleterious. Yeah, there you go. You know, this whole, like, big stupid tail that it's got. <laughs> pretty bad as yeah, far I mean, as like gonna being a thing that's gonna like and stuff but it just shows how <laughs> it, like i think it's interesting like the same thing with those fish then is that you know when you have that super gold color um it makes you a really easy target um but at the same time you want to have as gold of a color as possible that you maximize your reproductive fitness while not minimizing you know just a, no, maximizing just getting eaten by predators oh. essentially oh and especially as a fish like having that bright color to you is awful yeah because like so many predatory fish are adapted to looking for reflectiveness yeah that's like a thing like that's why fishing baits are the way they are Mm -hmm. is because so many like little prey fish have this spooky reflectiveness to them and so you end up with things like you know your northerns and muskies and in the ocean things like barracudas that are will go after anything that's reflective you know the land version of this is you see birds that have this similar affinity for things that are like shiny or reflective because again, Crows, a, lot of, a, lot for of, example. a lot of bug carapaces are that way mm-hmm. also and or so, like pigeons like yeah. that stuff i don't know do parrots like shiny stuff as much it doesn't seem like they care at least i've not no. noticed them caring i i don't know yeah um but yeah like especially being a fish being reflective like that is tough for like your survival rate but yeah. again like i said it seemingly is less tough as a survival thing than it is beneficial as a reproductive selection right. thing yeah um and again that's like the, that's what i was trying to or what i was getting at was the about the concept of balancing selection um which if you ever take an evolution course or anything to our viewers i mean i know you have ryan but <laughs> um like that uh that the 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 interplay between two different uh traits that are oppositely aligned for advancing fitness that is you have the trait of being shinier makes you more likely to reproduce for this fish but being shinier makes you less likely to survive you know being eaten by a predator as this fish that pushes the population gene pool towards sort of a balanced middling selection um, but that's just one type of selection. There is also, if you have two traits that both uh, add in one direction, you can have like extreme um, extreme selection, and it's uh, called directional selection, where it pushes um, the population gene pool hard in one direction very quickly. And when you hear about things like uh, 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 for what is it rapid differentiation where you have uh, punctuated equilibrium um, where you have a ton of re- evolutionary change in a really short period of time um, but that's marked on either side by really long periods of you know very little evolutionary change a lot of times it can happen that environmental factors and well know, and this is what you see after extinction events too yeah so you have leading up to an extinction event you tend to see a relative a relative slowing down of diversification that happens like you have a bunch of stuff that evolves to fill these niches those niches continue existing they don't change like terrifically a whole lot for however many hundreds of thousands millions of yeah. years and then you get this extinction event wipes out a bunch of the stuff and now all of a sudden it's like niches niches let's yeah. go let's run it <laughs> ecological power vacuum yeah. in a way there's <laughs> and just get... nutrients everywhere and no, nothing using them yeah and i feel like in, for a lot of people there is this like kind of interesting presumption of evolution as this thing that's like constantly sort of plodding forward at a relatively steady rate. When it's really um, not very often. Yeah, yeah. It's, like I said, it, it happens kind of in bursts mm-hmm. is kind of what the tendency is. Yeah. It tends to follow, like I said, an yeah. extinction event. Mutation, <laughs> mutation happens at a constant rate um, per species and per individual, but at a relatively constant rate. Yeah. But, and then, but actual selection of, of 
uh, phenotypes. Yeah. That it happens when you punctuate it first. And I think that it's easy to conflate mutation with evolution. Yeah. And I think it plays into the idea that you see a lot of the time this stuff is being like more or less evolved to right, like yeah. Yeah, that's a term you hear a lot is like you know you hear humans referred to as like more evolved monkeys basically which, is like nothing, which isn't yeah, true like yeah. we're exactly as evolved as every other living thing on earth is we evolved into we, a different niche yeah. one that happens to be able to exploit like fossil fuels yes. <laughs> like and there's because there's like you, we we tend to think of the like chimps being the most closely related thing to humans and so there's a tendency to imagine you know the chimp human divergence the thing that happens you know six six and a half or so million years ago as like an event where you know you have a chimp that exists and then all of a sudden you have this offshoot of humans that like chimps stop and yeah. then humans go off here and become right. humans and chimps are still here like we think of the last the most recent common ancestor of chimps and humans as being a yeah. chimp but for a while but not. yeah there <laughs> like, were two groups of proto-human chimps yeah. you know a, a mixture of both that looked really similar Except they had some little minor differences, maybe like troop size or like savanna versus jungle. Um, and they look basically the same. But then, you know, fast forward however many million years, um, and then all of a sudden, you know, we're hominid apes and they're like, I mean, I can't remember, are chimps hominid as well? Yeah. Yeah. But they're, you know, they have fur, you know, they're hanging out in the jungle. <laughs> like, we're, we're. But there is, like I said, this tendency to sort of order things by how relatively close they are related to humans, where it's like, As if yep, there's like a line a... that happens, and like the gibbons bro broke off, and like just were gibbons and stayed as gibbons, and then, yeah. you know, 15 million years ago the orangutans did the same thing, and 10 million yeah. years ago the gorillas did the same thing, and 6 million yeah. years ago the chimps did the same thing, and then we continued going. I mean, if you really want to talk <laughs> like... about what organism in the world is like the most evolved, you might say... HIV, um, which is the fact that it has the highest mutation rate of pretty much any organism on Earth, if you call viruses organisms. Um, in that sense, it mutates the most, it is the most evolved, you know what I mean? But again, this is just sort of, you know, not, not really that meaningful. The idea that, the, the point that we're trying to make is that the concept of most or least or relatively evolved doesn't really make, make much sense if two separate populations still exist yeah. at the same point in time. And they're both the same amount I mean, evolved. We are, I guess, more evolved than a trilobite is. Right. You but we're not that. more evolved than a trilobite is because we have a big brain. We're more evolved than a trilobite is because trilobites quit evolving 250 million years ago because they all died. When they died. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, the, fa the fact that, like... I'm able to like be on a computer here has nothing to do with my relative level of evolution versus a trilobite. Like that's yeah. fully like doesn't matter when how we smart say I am. More how evolved, my is. It just means there it's has been more time, time thing. <laughs> more time for mutation. Yeah. Um, and actually it's interesting you can use the concept of more evolved really good it's a really good way to judge time distance. Mm -hmm. You just look at um, through the genetic code, look at a phylogeny, which is sort of like the, um, a population gene map, in a way. Um, and you can look at how do genes look now, how do genes look in this specimen from the past, and then how much change has there been. And then knowing the mutation rate of that organism, you can guess how far back a sample goes. Um, so that's something I think is interesting. Um, it's not that... It's, Useful because the DNA doesn't last that long. But. Yeah, I mean, we're talking on some, like, college course, like, not useful to really anybody to, yeah. <laughs> who isn't, like, that's doing this specifically true. professionally type of stuff. Right. Which is fun, though. Like, that's why... It's, it's interesting. That's I, like, I, yeah. <laughs> um, it's and, interesting. It's not that useful for yeah. mostly anybody. I think, I think right. that the stuff that's useful, especially in the age of the pandemic, is the concept of... Um, Mutation versus evolution, the concept of selection versus genetic drift, mm -hmm. um, the concept of DNA as a structural marker of time, um, and the concept of the kinds of pressures that cause certain genotypes and, and like those phenotypes to be selected out of the population, which is what leads to like new variants of COVID, for example. Um, okay, we've been going for over an hour. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
But here's my trilobite that I made. There's a bottom side of it. I don't think I'm going to paint it just because I can't flip it over because my paint's still wet. But if you come and visit on March 26th from 4 to 6 p.m., you will get a similar trilobite. We have a few different uh, varieties of trilobite. They're all about the same scale. They're all comparably wiggly as far as I've seen. Um, but oh, it looks really good. Uh, Carl printed out a couple different types of them. And so your trilobite might look a little bit different than this. Um, but yeah, come visit us. We uh, have a sign-up sheet. We have a couple people that have already signed up, but we still have plenty of slots open. We just opened it up a couple days ago. So we're opening it up to 20 folks, and we currently have two sign-ups. But like I said, I think we just opened it up like yesterday. So spots are spots are closing fast. Yes, so come on get in down. There. I don't Secure know off the ticket. top of my head how expensive it is. Is it 20 bucks or something like that? It was even a little less than that. I don't remember like 15 the exact, maybe? Like maybe like 10, 15 bucks. But, All right. Um, don't quote me on the price. I don't know what it is. Uh, <laughs> ask Carl. <laughs> ask but Carl. just know that it's not super expensive, no. and you get an hour to hang out and paint. Um, yep. It's you get to fun. paint a get a three D printed critter. You get to paint it. We use our paints. We use our yeah. brushes, and you get to take it home with you. Yeah. And this week's this honestly, the trilobites are really really cool. They're yeah. like a really interesting print. Um, I, I thought that the the way that they have all the moving parts and stuff. So. And also the Headwater Science Center, just in general, we're open seven days a week, uh, nine thirty to five, Monday through Saturday, one to five on Sundays. Swing by if you happen to come by sometime between three thirty and if today's any indication, like four forty. Like, yeah, we might be doing a show. Yeah, this is like one of the longest shows. <laughs> <Good ever. happen. laughs> You're welcome to hang out and watch. We've had a couple guests walk by and rubberneck us for a little bit here yeah um but yeah uh and carl will maybe be doing a show this weekend sometime he usually does he usually does one on either saturday or sunday usually kind of a lecture one talking about some sort of usually prehistoric critter he might be doing trilobites who knows um so yeah if you want to see what carl's got to say and if you're in chat and are wondering gosh i need to know what the price is carl probably knows so exactly. get in chat and ask him about it when he's on doing his show either right. tomorrow or sunday um, but anyway, thank you guys for watching, and we'll